What's up, everybody? Super Metroid, let's do this. Yeah, it's uh, Eric and I here today. Eric's my roommate, he's my friend. He is a lot better at Super Metroid than I am, though I'm not too bad at it myself. And he is going to be playing through it. This is going to be a long Let's Play, similar to my Quake 4 one, so this will be done in several parts. But, uh, yeah, so why don't you take it away, Eric? This is Metroid 3. Alright, so long as you keep your hands away from those, uh, save state buttons. <laughs> yes, we just spent an hour doing a Let's Play of Mega Man X3, um, just doing part one of it, and right at the end I was going to save it, and I went to hit escape to bring up the menu, and instead I hit F1, which loaded my first save state and completely overwrote my hour of play. It was horrible. But then I realized that we didn't use headphones in that recording, so <laughs> it didn't matter anyway because the audio was being doubled back on itself for my microphone. So, anyway, we've got headphones this time. Eric can actually hear the game. I can't really hear it too terribly well. But, uh... Just, so, just some awesome music right now. It's yeah. Good. It's a very moody, very atmospheric game. Certainly good to play, but nothing crucial that you need to hear on it. So... So why don't you give a... Give them a bit of backstory on your uh, history with Metroid, how you came to play Super Metroid the first time, and everything else about it. Oh, uh, let's see. Super Metroid, I think, originally what got me started in it was my brother. Uh, he used to play it on an emulator all the time, and I'd watch him. And uh, eventually, you know, I started playing it on my own, along with a lot of other uh, Super Nintendo games. Um, I really didn't beat it until uh, several years after I'd started playing it. I was already in high school. But, uh... I mean, it's a pretty standard story. Yeah. Samus gives the Metroid to some scientists and tells them, alright, now don't fuck this up. And the first thing the scientists do is fuck it up. <laughs> That's not true. They get attacked by Ridley, but still. Huh, I wonder what this Metroid would do if I stuck it on my head. <laughs> you see them running around wearing the Metroid as a hat. Also, if you can't tell, the version of the game that I downloaded for my emulator is in German. Well, it's subtitled in German. Yeah. There's no actual audio except until, like, there's audio right in the beginning. Yeah, Mitch in hell the roof. We need Kyle in here, too. <laughs> <laughs> We're at Angry Griffin. We, we need Kyle in here to read that. Something about a space station. Just go with that. Yeah. Space. For station. Wait, so this is like a whole colony? Yeah. Does that mean it has like civilians and stuff? And I just leave them all there? Samus is a heartless bitch. And that's why we love her. Which makes it all the more frustrating in Other M when they turn her into a whiny little girl. Samus is nothing if... <sighs> Samus is not a whiny little girl. It's like, yeah, Samus would never have any sort of emotional collapse at anything ever. Oh, dead people. Oh, uh, dead people. Dead scientists. Dead Told you not to wear the Metroid as a hat, you stupid idiots. I will say one of the things that's cool about Samus, she was raised by, uh, you know, Chozo. Yeah. Also, she is a freaking Amazon woman. Even without the power armor, she's like six foot seven. Something like that. Metroid. Metroid. How does he just appear? I don't think he uses that in any other Metroid game. I also don't think they have uh, any way, to, anywhere to take the story after Fusion. Because all the bosses, like all the enemies are all kind of dead after Fusion. Because the X like killed them. And then, you know, took them over. Ridley's certainly dead. There was just an X that had his likeness. I love what they did with uh, the animation of Ridley's tail. Rather than actually animating it, they just had it as a bunch of circles. Okay. 
like all the space colonies, it decides to self-destruct. Well, I think that's pretty much a given in any sort of sci-fi. Certainly in Metroid. I don't think there's a single Metroid game that doesn't involve an explosion. I know, um, I bet that's something other M cuts out too. <laughs> I know that, um... I mean, they complain about her using the power bomb, right? So maybe there's an explosion at some point. Perhaps. Something I think most people actually miss is that uh, Metroid is very much based off of um, Alien and the Alien movie franchise. Did you know that? Oh, I did. Yeah, for example, you know, uh, Ridley Scott directed the first Alien. Oh yeah, I guess that makes sense. And Ridley was the boss. Um, it's very much, they wanted Samus to be sort of a play on the character of uh, Ripley from Alien. And then Metroid, and do you know the history of the word Metroid? Nope. Uh, it was supposed to be a combination of Metro and Android, and it was created, it was coined to uh, describe Samus. So, uh, I know that they didn't originally intend Samus to be a girl, so how does this fit in with your, uh, you know, alien movie analogy? Well, it was later in the development cycle that they started okay, adding so all that. Just... You know when, uh... Alien was released? Um, I want to say 1979. I can look it up. I do think that was before uh, the first Metroid. Oh, very much so. That might have been even before some of the first... Uh... Shut up, I'm bad with dates. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, for example, the uh, Metroids themselves are a play on the larval stage of the aliens. You know, the facehuggers. And the, uh, the later forms of the Metroid, such as the uh, Omega Metroid and the end of Metroid Fusion, is very much uh, designed after the Xenomorphs from Alien. Xenomorph Ball. But yeah, Samus is definitely, even without her power armor, Samus is an Amazon woman. Yeah, she's like. I mean, she's able to take on... She's able to, by herself, with nothing but a pistol, assault the, uh... Yeah. <laughs> assault an alien's... Uh, a, a space pirate spaceship. Mothership, in fact. Full of space pirates. Before she gets her, uh... Power suit back. She even manages to accidentally, like, kill a few of them by getting them to shoot each other. Yeah, I know. That's hilarious. Although, you've still never beaten Metroid Prime. No, I haven't. I think most people consider Metroid Prime to be uh, the most, uh, the second best Metroid in the series. Some you consider it even better than Super Metroid. Um, but I know a lot of people consider it to be very close in quality to Super Metroid, as well as in tone. I really need to do, I do need to go back through and beat that. Yeah. It's the 3D, or the first person aspect really turned me off to it, but uh... I'll try and get over that. I actually really like playing it with a GameCube controller over playing it with the Wiimote because the GameCube controller really makes it feel... Well, it, it doesn't play like most first-person shooters, which, uh, you know, I like. I live here somewhere, too. Yeah. yeah, but you can't get that. Gotta get bombs first, at least. I've never figured out what the purpose of that eyeball is. It's a, to let them know that you're here. It's it's a camera. I understand that, but does it have any gameplay purpose? Not really. It's just there to, you know, be, oh, Samus is here, all right. Though on, uh, you know, older emulate or on uh, less powerful devices, that thing causes crazy lag. Really? Uh-huh. It's uh, apparently fairly difficult to emulate. I've never played this on a less on a underpowered device before, so I tried to play it on the Dingu once. It uh, that particular part it didn't like at all. Like it managed to do it, but uh... you know I've never actually beaten this game. Seriously? Seriously, I've gotten very far in it, but I never actually beat it. So you've never like seen the ending? I've seen the ending. Like I've seen it beaten. I've seen it played all the way through. But you've never. Yeah, I've never done it myself. But yeah, I know the ending. Come on. I can't 
it's the controller. I actually, on my uh, disc copy, or not my disc, my, um, my cartridge copy, because I do have an original cartridge copy, which I totally remember you freaking out when I first showed it to you. Come on. I don't think Eric grew up with an actual Super Nintendo. Or a Super Nintendo controller, apparently. Yeah, I grew up with an abundance right. of both. To this day, I still have three Super Nintendos, and I think we're about to buy a fourth one to do our uh, portable. So, yeah, I have a bit of a, I have a bit of experience there. So I guess the camera is now why the space pirates are here. Yeah. It saw you. They, uh, they showed up. They didn't like it. Figure out single wall jumping with this thing too. I'm gonna try and do some basic sequence breaking on this run. But uh, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. I remember I actually discovered uh So are these guys supposed to be space pirates too? I don't think so. Like they weren't around before, so I think they're just kinda of creatures, which means Samus is a mass murderer. Just destroying the random creatures. It's like all of these dudes are sentient. Every single one. They did actually remake most of them in uh, uh, Metroid Prime. Like those little guys they remade. And the little, uh, the guys you can't kill that travel back and forth, they remade, they remade these. They did a really a fantastic job translating this into 3D with Metroid Prime. I was, I was very, very impressed. I remember the first Metroid game I ever beat was uh, Metroid Zero Mission, which is very much as if, you know, it's the first Metroid if it were made like Metroid, like Super Metroid. Now we get... If you're really good, you can actually get this bomb without activating this dude, but, uh... It's hard. I, I'm, I've never managed to do it. You have to, like, fly in the door at the perfect angle and, like, make it back out and nothing flat. I think one of the things that I didn't like about this game, um, one of the things that turned me off to it and why I've never beaten it, is that it's, uh, it's a lot slower paced than Metroid Fusion and Metroid Zero Mission. Um, Samus' movements certainly have to be a lot more deliberate in this game. You want to talk about some good pixel art? Yeah, yeah. Just Samus herself is like a masterpiece of pixel art. And yet they still have the morph ball because she can't crawl. Actually, they probably can make her crawl, but they had already established point, the morph ball as it. Iconic, yeah. yeah. This kind of reminds me of a Mayan pyramid. This uh, particular portion of the game. You get, kinda you get what I mean by it? Yeah, I do. Yeah, it does. I bet it's like electronic or something. Yeah. Well, I think it's supposed to be Chozo. Yeah. Chozo ruins. But yeah, as, um... I don't know, should we recover topics we covered in the Mega Man X playthrough that got botched and we have to completely redo? I mean, might as well. Yeah. We don't have very much stuff to talk about, sadly, and this game is uh, quite long. I promise we'll come up with more stuff. Well, I'm thinking, you know, perhaps we should do something similar to the Let's Drown Outs where, you know, we play longer games. Not so much boring games, because this is quite an entertaining game, but, you know, we just find things to talk about. It's a hack and touch. I think we're doing that. Yeah, we're, uh, we're considering, we have a... We're actually, for those of you who are watching this and don't know us in person, um, Eric and I are both uh, engineers, we're IT engineers, and we um, we have a lab that's a, a virtual ESXi lab, and we're thinking of uh, turning one of the machines into a Hackintosh. Which you know, we, just because. Yeah. I mean, the lab is pretty much there to learn, so there's no reason not to repurpose it to do uh, 
you know, other experiments. I know we're already going to turn one of them into a steam box so that we can focus from uh, the couch instead of just uh, you know, our desks. Oh, that's where you go to fight Phantom, isn't it? No, that's uh, actually where you go to fight Mother Brain. Oh, oh right, because you have the four bosses. Yeah, it's been a while since I've played this. I'm going to have to get all reacclimated. <laughs> Ooh, who should play Metroid Fusion? Because we're both mm. good at it. Maybe we can take turns on each of the stages or something. Yeah, we should do that. Pretty good, maybe like kind of. Or take turns be between the playthroughs. Yeah. You know, have one person play for an hour. Um, which, by the way, that's going to be the, uh, the length of time for this video. Uh, each of the portions are going to be about yeah, an hour. This is the one. Are you going to try and sequence break here? Yeah. See if I can pull it off. Yeah, Eric's quite good at sequence breaking this game. I'm significantly. Uh, I can do a little bit of sequence breaking, but not very much. Depending on how long this takes, we may have to actually fast forward this part. Well. Um, I think we can do that with the YouTube editor. I've never used it before. I'd say don't spend too much time on it, though. <laughs> if you can't get it, you can't get it. Dude, I can get it. I can totally get it. Oh, man. I feel like we're going to... This is going to be one of those situations where... To get the, there's a super missile past this, and uh, to get it, you have to do something that's called mock balling, where you conserve the momentum of running uh, while being in a morph ball. And you do it by uh, starting a run, jumping, and then right before hitting the ground, turning into a ball like that. If you do it too soon, you bounce like that, but if you time it just when you hit the ground, you can do it. Uh, you turn straight into a ball, and it lets you get past those, uh, pillars, yeah, while still being fast enough to, uh, get past the disintegrating blocks. Perhaps you need to change your controls? I don't think so. It's not the controls, it's just the timing. Yeah. It usually takes me a few tries to get, but I generally get pretty fast, you know, it's pretty good. Yeah. Ah. Almost, so close. I remember actually uh, playing this section before and not realizing that you could run because I was, you know, I had played Metroid Fusion and Metroid Zero Mission first, which didn't have a run button. So I didn't know that a run button existed. Come on. By the way, he is using um, an actual SNES controller. Uh, it's a USB SNES controller. So it's it's quite good. It actually it feels better than my real SNES controllers because I think um, everything's new. The buttons are still crisp. The ones that I have have been played way too hard for 20 years, and they're just kind of mushy. Alright, if you don't get it this time, then we're just gonna have to, uh... No, dude, gotta get this. Well, I guess we'll have to fast forward through this section whenever we... Cut it out. Yeah. I've been doing these videos so far with no extra editing because I'm lazy like that. I have been Yeah. Well, I think YouTube has an editor as well. It'll let us do that, that's great. Oh, shit. Oh, oh, uh, there it goes. No fast forwarding needed. Awesome. These dudes don't kill me. That would be awful. Super missiles. No. 
giant plant monster dude required. <laughs> well, we still have to fight him, but nope. not really. Nope. Well, it's called sequence break. As you can tell, Eric knows this game quite a bit better than I do. I think one of the sad things about this game is, you know, like like all Metroid games, they're all fantastic, but they don't sell very well. I think the first Metroid game that ever actually sold anything was Metroid Prime. Um, and that was mostly because the games were so advanced, they came out on... Uh, they came out near the end of the console's life cycle because they had to know how to, you know, fully utilize the console's hardware. Yeah. And also because it just it took so much time to develop the game. Did this have a Netflix trip? I'm not sure. I can check. It really occurred to me to check. It might, um, for those, uh, you know... It surprised me if it did. Yeah, I know Star Fox had its, uh... Star Fox had a Mario chip. Charge beam is down here, which is honestly out of all the beams, I think I like charge beam the best. <laughs> charge beam? Yes. Okay, the Super FX chip was in Yoshi's Island and uh, yeah, Yoshi's Island and Star Fox. And there were several variations of it. The CX4 was the Capcom chip, um, and that was in Mega Man X, X2, and X, or Mega Man X2 and X3. Uh, there was a DSP chip for Pilot Wings, which was a game, I guess, and Super Mario Kart. It was a math coprocessor, and it was uh, it also provided fast support for floating point and trigonometric calculations needed by 3D math algorithms. Cool. There were several iterations of it throughout the NES life cycle. SD Gundam used it. Uh, Top Gear 3000 I didn't even know existed. Here we go, this is what we want. List of Super NES games that used uh, the chips. Uh, it looks like most of the DSP chips were in uh, Japanese games. Here we go. Let's see. Huh, Dragon Ball Z Hyperdimension used an SA-1 chip. Kirby Superstar used an SA-1 chip. Wow. Mm -hmm. Didn't know that. Should I try this? I cannot do that. What it's do you... Though. That would take too long. What do you get if you get up top? Um, shoot. I think you can get uh, power bombs early. Super Mario RPG used an SA-1. Star Ocean used an SDD-1. Yeah, that surprised me. That game was like, for Super Nintendo, that game was beautiful. Star Fox was the Super FX. Yoshi's Island was the Super FX. Doom was the Super FX. Ah, Star Fox 2 was cancelled. Okay, I saw Star Fox 2 on there and I thought, wait a minute, what? But supposedly it was going to use both the Super FX and the or Super FX GSU 2. I see. So yeah, it doesn't look like Super Metroid had an enhancement chip. Well, they made it look beautiful anyhow. Well again, that's one of the things about good pixel art, is it can be quite beautiful and you know something um, I think Yahtzee actually said. 2D games that look good. They don't really age. I mean, they age very gracefully. Yeah. Uh, versus 3D games, you know, a game that looked beautiful years ago is ugly as hell right now. I like this beam, too. It's amazing. It's not in any other Metroid game, I don't think. Well, uh, it's been... It's, it's been in the first Metroid. It's integrated into other themes in the later games. Well, yeah, but, I mean... They don't call it Spazer. Yeah. But what it does, it gets integrated later on. It's... The name Spacer disappears, which I don't really like. Because, yeah, Metroid Fusion had the wide beam, which is basically the Spacer beam. Well, it was like two, wasn't it? No, it was three. No, it was three. The first one was the charge beam, which gave you kind of the crescent moon shaped shot. Ah, huh. Spacer, Spacer, I get it. <laughs> I wonder if that was a, a translation issue. I doubt it. 
did, so I'm sure it was just a, you know, naming for but they, they like the Z. Um, let's do this. I didn't know about that. Didn't? No. Alright. Yeah, there are a great many things in this game that I do not know about. Do you know why, um, speaking of the Z and them lost in translation, do you know why they call Dragon Ball Z Dragon Ball Z? It was Dragon Ball 2. Oh. And they, uh, the translator messed it up and got it, the 2 confused with a Z, and they just kind of liked it, so they let it stick. So what does the G stand, or GT stand for in Dragon Ball GT? Generation something. If I could bomb jump, I'm terrible at bomb jumping. Okay, hang on. Sadly, this isn't the days of uh, a Metroid Zero mission where you can just spam endless amounts of bomb. Uh, endless amounts of bombs to bomb jump like I did. Oh, come on. It's not that hard. Alright, kinda. This isn't even like sideways bomb jumping or anything crazy. Well, there's like, there's another bomb jumping method that's much faster where you put a bomb at the top of the arc, too. Yeah. Where it's like dunk, dunk, dunk. That's what I usually do. And like, you can do that, but this is generally more reliable if I can actually do it. Thing is, I got used to uh, the other Metroid games bomb jumping. Yeah. That is something they had to take out of Prime because, uh,. Bomb jumping in Prime is just something that wasn't going to happen in that 3D engine. Ah. And there's only a few instances where you can bomb, where you have to bomb jump, mm -hmm. and it's only one jump. It's like you jump and then leave one in the air, and then bounce back up and hit the air, but you can only do it one time. It's just like in uh, Fusion, it's, uh, you can barely bomb jump at all. Yeah. It's, uh, there's a way to do it, but it's not possible to do, like, as a human. Like, you have to, like... Wall jump, morph ball, bomb, unmorph ball, wall jump, hit the bomb. It's really annoying. Yeah, I can imagine. You can only do it with uh, tool assisted stuff. So, where is this taking us? Great. Uh, oh, don't, oh, don't die. die. You haven't saved yet. We're uh, 30 minutes in, you haven't saved once. Oh, yeah. I tend to skip those. Probably shouldn't do that, especially. Considering you're low on health. Yeah, it shouldn't be a big deal. I love how uh, this actually reminds me of um, Wheel Gator's uh, stage in Mega Man X2, where they have the ship faced like a dragon. And that, of course, is a you fun... you seriously not drop any health? Is there a save room before you fight Kraid? I think there is, yeah. There's also one of those. Uh, yeah, an X2 where you have the uh, alligator Actually, face. no. There's one of these. Oh, well, that's useful too, though. It'd still be nice if you could actually get uh, a save just in case you die. <laughs> I don't think I'll die to Grey. He's like, last time I fought him, I didn't get hit. Yeah, but. As it's Luke said to uh, Emperor Palpatine, your overconfidence is your weakness. And sadly, Palpatine could not report retort properly since Samus has no friends. At least not at this point in the story. I need that. 
They did try to shoehorn a love interest into fusion. Well. And then they put it even more into a zero mission. Ow. I think that's where they went wrong. Yeah, you only have one uh, health tank. Okay. Unlike Mega Man, those are not instant death spikes. <laughs> yeah, but if this were Mega Man, you could very easily cling to the wall. So yeah, if you, uh, for anyone who's a veteran of the first uh, Metroid, there's a little redirect there with the small Kraid. Because uh, Kraid in Metroid 1 was that size. Well, I think you're uh, not used to using a Super Nintendo controller. I've been playing with a PS2 controller lately, haven't you? A PS3 controller. Yeah. He's turning uh, yellow. Yeah, thank God this isn't Mega Man. <laughs> he would be dead. Ooh, he's turning bright yellow. And there he goes. And somehow all of the spikes also magically disappear. Okay, so, speaking of sequence breaking. Various suit. Gotta love the damage reduction. Yeah, that'll be helpful, especially since you uh, only have one health tank. Talk about nice pixel art. <laughs> yeah. Only time you get to see that again is when Samus goes like this. What do you think had better overall graphics? Met Super Metroid or Mega Man X? Hmm. I think we're going to be pretty biased on this. But it is definitely close. Yeah. In terms of, like... The thing is, they're like completely different styles. In terms of setting up atmosphere, Super Metroid, I think, was much better. Oh, yes. I would agree. Um, Mega Man X is all about action. Super Metroid really pulls you into the other games. I don't know. I'd have to say they're both about equal, personally. I am going to have to go for it. Super Metroid. Just a bit. Like I said, Super Metroid is definitely better in setting up its uh, world, but I think Mega Man was quite a bit better in not having the whole repeating block syndrome, which Metroid very much has. Depends where you are. The thing is, you know, some places in the world do look like that. The super bomb would be nice right about now. Yeah, because you can't kill those guys without, uh... There you go. Woo, an E-tank. Awesome. This completely fill your health, too. Oh, yeah. Nice. So, I guess we should get into some of our topics now. Since we've already, yeah. we've already exhausted the Sherlock Holmes topic on our previous botched Let's Play, so we can, we'll, we'll do that one later. Um, what do you want to talk about first? Um, oh, you're so decisive. Indeed. Anything going on in the tech world? Ooh, what do you think about the comparison between the R9-295X and the Titan Z? I think that's a pretty unfair comparison. The Titan Z just, like, doesn't make sense. I don't know if it does. I mean, I know it's more powerful, but I don't know if it's that much more powerful. Like, okay, in terms of cost efficiency, yeah, it's going to be better, but... One of the things about it, though, is that the, um, the Titan Z does not have a water cooler built in. 
the that's true. The no. default. Uh, that's you can do that, but I don't have enough super missiles to test it. Well, it's what you do is there's a way you can run up to it, jump, and shoot a super missile and open it from this side, but it's like one pixel high and it takes about 40 super missiles to get it. Yeah. If you're not safe stating, which I don't want to do. Yeah. But um, anyway, the Titan Black is certainly more powerful, probably quieter, and I'd assume it runs cooler. But um, it is interesting to see a both a vapor chamber and in a water cooler implemented into the 295X built on the stock. That's kind of, that's what's interesting to me there. Yeah. Um. Oh, so what do you think about heart bleed? Heart bleed. Well, I, I think it comes as no surprise that the NSA has been using it. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. That's, uh, but I think we're going to be seeing the, uh, repercussions of that for some time to come. Yeah, it's probably, I feel like any exploit we find in the next few years, it's like, oh yeah, the NSA's been doing that for years. Here we go. Um, it's certainly a big issue, but I feel like it's, it does eclipse a lot of other issues. Um, and what, because while it is big itself, it's not the biggest issue in the, you know, security today. I don't know, dude. Like, I would have to disagree there. I think that may be the biggest security vulnerability ever. True, I'm not saying that it's not, but I'm saying it's it's eclipsing a lot of other big issues just because it's so big in itself. And, you know, it's going to take a long time to get fixed, and that's going to be, that's problematic. Well, that, that depends on what you mean. Like, it's already patched. It's just uh, a matter of what's already been taken. Like, uh, if site certificates have been taken, then there are problems. But those can always be reissued. Yeah, but for the time being... Yeah. Moral of the story is, you haven't already changed your password. Yeah. The simple fact is, you know, we're both technical people, but... As technical as Heartbleed is, it's still pretty layman's change your password is all you can do. <laughs> Though I suppose it is good uh, practice to change your password every few weeks anyway. Oh, well, yeah, but I mean, ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> Don't do what everyone does, and that's use your password uh, using the same password for everything. And I know, you know, it's... That, that's one of the biggest problems with the web today is that everything wants you to create an account. And, you know, you're going to use the same password because you don't want to memorize a hundred different passwords. It's like you can do things like, you know, incorporate the site name into a generic password to make it unique. Yeah. Like there are a lot of techniques you can use to make it easier, but yeah, it is a pain. I'll be honest, I do tend to use the same password on all the sites. Yeah, I don't know what your password is. Ah, oh, no you don't. I changed them all. Really? Oh. So can I tell our viewers what the password you used to use is? Sure, if you like it. <laughs> nah, no reason to reveal that, because we do still have things that use that password. You know? Yeah. For me, I had, I don't want to call it an algorithm, but it was just a... It was a pattern I used to sort of generate passwords based on what I needed, but, you know, it did tend to come up with the same passwords. So I, I have a cycle of about four or five different passwords that I used. Um, so and then well, apparently Spazer can shoot through walls. Hmm. I thought that was only the wave band. Yeah, it may just be these platforms. Yeah. Well, maybe because the whole Spazer beam is not being locked off, too. Gotta love that single wall jump in there. Really going to have to get used to this controller. Yeah, here we go. What about uh Netflix and net neutrality? Yeah, that's going to be very interesting. I think um I'm pretty sure that Time Warner Cable has started uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Throttling Netflix. Yeah, for its I, users. I think they have. 
Um, Unfortunately, because we have Time Warner. Yeah, we do, which is bad because we have very, very fast internet, and yet we still have issues with Netflix. And um, they're definitely, definitely throttling YouTube because when we have 60 megabit download, there should be no reason in the world we can't do a 1080p video uh, in full speed. But, you know, that still happens quite often. Um, there are ways to get around it. The thing is, it's... They haven't introduced any packages that's like, you know, pay us more money and we'll stop throttling these sites for you, which is an interesting... I don't think Time Warner Cable wants its consumers yet to actually know that they're throttling. I think it's more along the lines of, I think they're going to offer a Netflix competition. And then they're going to, uh, you know, want you to pay on the side of this. The problem is... Netflix, on the whole, I think is a good company, just because they are very much for, you know, neutrality. They, they, they want the internet to be free, even though... It's like, that's true to some degree, but I think at the moment it's only because it benefits them. That's true, but, uh, you know, they may be a fair-weather friend, but at least they're a friend at the moment. Yeah. And, uh, I think it was their CEO that stated that they were very willing to use their consumer base to essentially go to war with Time Warner um, or any other company and I think Google is partnering with them as well as uh, I think Microsoft is also partnering with, partnering with them on the net neutrality front yeah that would be like wonderful Google Microsoft and uh, Netflix what will be really great is if we go to Google Fiber the problem is that only solves it for us not for the world well yeah but I think Google Fiber will expand yeah. Which is, it's funny, I mean... It's like there's know. certainly a demand for it. Yeah, and especially for, um, you know, their thoughts of uh, internet being a basic human right, which I think it should be in this day and age. Uh, yeah. And the fact that with Google Fiber, if they just implement, you know, the fiber lines, then you can get, was it a 5 megabit download for free? Yeah. Uh, which is amazing. And, you know, for most people who aren't tech people, that's more than enough, especially if there's, you know, unlimited bandwidth going on, which I think there is. Ah. Ah. Careful. Ah. Run, Samus, run. That hurts. Couldn't get back up. Plus, if we uh, if we start our own business, then you know having Google Fiber for the upload will be quite beneficial. Yeah. Because right now we only have enough upload to do like one well compressed 1080p video, <laughs> which is sad. I think that's really the biggest event benefit of what is it a, a T4 line is it now or is it T3? Well, ours is a T3 sort of. Ours is a ours isn't a no. We just have a, a consumer line. We have the top end consumer line. But if we were to get a business line in. I mean, a, a T3 is much different than uh, what we have. Well, doesn't a T3 give you the same upload as download? Yeah, that's, that's the well, benefit. Well, it, it's, it's bi-directional. Yeah. So it would be more like half and half. But... Well, yeah, but they're equal. You would get better upload, which um, certainly if you're hosting an active website is very important. You know, or if you're hosting any kind of media content, that's incredibly important. <clears throat> Incidentally, I have, like, no idea where I'm going right now. I'm just kind of exploring. I see. Well, we're at 43 minutes. We'll uh, we'll end this video at an hour mark, depending on what the uh, we'll get up you know, there somehow. when we get to a stopping point. Yeah. Ow. So, assuming uh, anyone watching this video is a Sherlock Holmes fan, we may as well get into this topic again. Um, Fine. There's, <laughs> I know we already went through all of this before, but if we had to delete the video, so. There's, uh, for those of you who don't know, there's two main series right now that we're both following. There's uh, Sherlock, the BBC series, and then there's Elementary, which is an American series. Um, now, I think we're both of the mind that Sherlock, on the whole, is better. I know that tends to be a common perception. Um, but uh, we should get into the details of why it's better. Um, Let's say first off the characters. You want to go through and describe the difference between the two characters this time? Oh, sure. Uh, Sherlock from Elementary seems extremely emotional. Uh, almost childish in his emotions. Uh, Sherlock from, uh, well, 
Sherlock tends to be, you know, much more detached than antisocial, how the original Sherlock was portrayed. Uh, Watson in uh, Elementary seems much more like a... Oh, that's a speak Mr. Nice. Um, much more of a... Um, designed to be sort of a lesser Sherlock, whereas, uh, you know, just slightly less intelligent, but overall the same basic character design. Whereas Watson in uh, Sherlock tends to be much more focused on, you know, more doing his own thing. He's, he's kind of an anti-Sherlock. He's more of a foil to Sherlock rather than a parallel. And um, I think that's the biggest thing because uh, the Sherlock character in Sherlock versus the character in Elementary, I think, is much more realistic of how someone with uh, antisocial disorder seriously acts. Um, I know firsthand. <laughs> uh, and Watson as well, you know, certainly is a normal person who likes to surround himself with unusual people. And uh, that's definitely a big theme in the series. Um, so I think their dynamic works a lot better. They have a much more contrast of nature. Compared to, you know, in elementary, they're very similar. It's just, you know, sometimes Watson's making the breakthroughs and sometimes Sherlock is. Which doesn't make any sense to me. You know, a friend of ours, Robert, mentioned that he liked elementary's Watson better because it very much follows the uh, monomyth, um, you know, cycle for a hero. And that, you know, there's the mentor character, and then there's the protege character. And the problem I have with that is in a monomyth system, the mentor character is usually not the main focus of the story, or, you know, they die, or they disappear from the story. And Sherlock does not fit into that category. He's always going to be around. There's actually a trope about that. Um... It's like a too awesome to exist trope, where if you have somebody who supersedes the main character in abilities, if they are of the same class of abilities, then almost uh, every time the mentor will die. Yeah, and that's not going to happen. So that's the problem I have with Elementary. Whereas, you know, Elementary is focused on making Watson uh, a mini Sherlock. Um, the BBC's Sherlock is focused on making Watson, you know, the inverse. You know, they want him to excel uh, in other ways. They want him to be, you know, he's the emotional character. He's the one that teaches Sherlock how to act around people. Um, so, you know, that's uh, that's just, our, just my thoughts and Eric's thoughts on that. On the whole, though, they're both very good series and I highly recommend them. But I definitely consider the BBC Sherlock to be in a league of its own compared to the uh, elementary series. Yeah, it's like, if I were to rate them on a scale of 1 to 10, I'd say elementary is like, oh, hey, look at that. Elementary is an oh, hey, look at that? Yeah. Um, I'd put it at, like, a uh, 7.5 or an 8. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Sherlock, I would... The thing is, like, if I hadn't seen Sherlock, I think I would appreciate uh, elementary much more. Uh, I, it's, I know this because I saw... Um, Elementary first, and I liked it much more before seeing Sherlock. Really? I didn't know you'd seen Elementary first. It's, yeah. I saw Elementary. It was the first thing I saw. And then, uh, after seeing Sherlock, it lowered my opinion of, it, it's like I probably would have rated Elementary closer to a 9 before. Now it's, you know, dropped significantly, and Sherlock is at like a 9.5. And then the Robert Downey Jr. movies are just awful. I gotta kill that little and it's terrible, too, because I used to love the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock movies. They were, I thought they were quite good until I saw a real interpretation of Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, I still like the movies. I do like them, but it's... To put it in perspective, I think Elementary is better than the Robert Downey Jr. movies. Oh, yeah, I do, too. And... I, I, I feel that, like... That was a different interpretation of Sherlock, but... I think it was still more accurate than Elementary's. It was, but it was just... It was performed with less grace. And the uh, Moriarty in that series, I just did not like. I found ah, him to be... Try. Don't you already have Speed Booster? Oh, yeah. 
I was gonna say, you didn't need to do that there. Oh well. Got through without speed booster. Makes it doubly cool when you have it. Certainly after seeing the Moriarty characters in both Elementary and in the BBC Sherlock, the uh, Moriarty in the Robert Downey Jr. movies is just pitiful. Which is really strange to say. Because um, they, did, they did do some interesting things, but it's just... You know. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's and you still, same. you still haven't gotten to Moriarty in Elementary. No, I haven't. Um, which, perhaps you should watch that tonight. Perhaps. Oh, please. Because Moriarty does come back in Season 2. I freaking love the beams in this game. Like, every time you get a beam, it's just like, yeah! Ice beam, bitch! And I very much like uh, the Moriarty in the BBC Sherlock. Though I didn't at first. I actually found him to be uh, too over the top initially. And that, that first, uh, you know, the first meeting with him at the pool? Yeah. I didn't, I didn't actually like that meeting. I didn't like him as a character until the... Uh, finale of season two when you actually have the real run-in with him. Um, that was certainly a much more compelling uh, character arc. You know what other mission game we should play is uh, Zero Mission? Yes. Well, I'm sure we'll go through all three of them at some point. It's, uh, I am much better at sequence breaking Zero Mission than I am at this one. You notice like, how that one jumps slightly higher so you can yeah. move ball through. It's good game design. Yes, it is. They did quite a good job on uh, this whole game, game design-wise. Yes. I guess that's like the entire point of the game, actually. But you know, everything is structured just so, so that uh, you can't get to it unless you meet certain conditions. And then, uh, you know, if you can get around those conditions, you can get to them early. Yeah. One of the things, um, I think this is something actually Ego Raptor mentioned about Mega Man in his uh, sequelitis video, but certainly about Metroid as well, is uh, this game very much taught you through, you know, it taught you through the gameplay. Yeah. Um, although there was quite a bit of experimentation required. But, you know, this game definitely falls into the category of 8-bit difficulty. Maybe not so much in the bosses themselves, but in the requirement of exploration that so few games do nowadays. Yeah, the, like, amount of backtracking you have to do in this game is pretty preposterous. The problem, or the thing about it is, the backtracking in this is fun because you're always discovering new areas yeah, in the places you've like been. Yeah, you always have new weapons and new things you can do with them. And it's always fun to go up to an enemy that gave you trouble and uh, hit him with your... Uh... the base with an ice beam. <laughs> yeah. Always fun. Now I can do this. This is the thing I was talking about before. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, you could have just super missile the guys and killed them. I didn't want to kill them. You have to jump them. Well, I've done it before where I super missile them and then I see the oh, wall jump. Oh, yeah, 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 that works too. Oops. I'd say try and stay more toward the middle this time. Yeah. It doesn't really matter, but yeah, I guess. There you go. But yeah, I, I've single wall jumped before. Actually, I've bomb jumped up there. Uh, with them in the way before. Which one of these do you drop down through the middle uh, of? Not that one, not that one. No, that, that one's eating you. Thank God it opens its mouth so you can get away. Oh, you know the ones on the ceiling will eat you too? Yeah, I would assume so. And they like hold you up there. It's pretty funny. Oh no. Oh, no. Ooh, that was lucky. I should be able to get uh, super missiles. I already have super missiles. Yeah, super missiles. Uh, power bomb. Down here. Oh yes, those little caterpillar enemies. That's the cool thing about Metroid, is how you can watch the uh, enemies evolve over time. Well, they don't do that much in uh, this one. Really? They, I yeah, thought they, they, they that's, do. That's more... Um, you can see like the different stages, but those guys themselves will never actually change. Wow. I think you're thinking of uh, Fusion. I am, but I thought this game did it as well. 
It's like uh, I fought some of their later stages earlier, but uh, and I think that's enough for me to go get uh, Gravity Suit. I may need... no, I need the grappling hook. Huh? There's there's this part where you have to be able to sideways wall jump to get past if you uh, want to do it without it. Oh. It's like this big water. Yeah, I remember. Thing. Sideways wall jumping is uh, quite difficult. Uh, I meant bomb jumping, sorry. Yeah, sideways bomb jumping is quite difficult. There's also a way you can do it just by running that I, I don't really get. Oh, I think you were standing on the thing. Yeah, it was supposed to be. <laughs> well, we're up to 55 minutes. I think this is a good stopping point. Oh, good as any. All right. Well, see you next time. See ya.